Hey everyone, it's Jim Fisk here. And it's Stephanie Laws. And this weekend is the 2017 Global Drupal Sprint Weekend. It's taking place at Pega Systems office, which is located at 1 Rogers Street in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Starting January 28th at 9 a.m. and ending January 29th at 6 p.m. So we really hope you can join us. This year we're making a big push to get some new people involved. So what we did at Janku is we created a Docker image that has Drupal already installed on it and a bunch of tools that will make your development a lot easier. So we're going to switch over to Stephanie's computer and we're going to go through the installation process together. Sounds awesome. All right, let's get started. Okay, so we're over here on Stephanie's computer and I pulled up a website here called hub.docker.com and uh, I've gone to the address for the Janku Drupal lamp that we've created. Um, the first thing we need to do though before we start downloading the lamp stack that we created is we need to install Docker on Stephanie's computer. So the way to do that is to go Search for Docker Toolbox. Click on the first link that appears and go to download the Mac version of Docker. It'll start downloading this package over here. And once that's complete, just say to keep it on your computer and click the package. Press continue, 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 and then install. Type in the password for the computer, and the installation process will start. Okay. So this was successful. We're going to close out of this window, and I'm going to go into the Finder, and under Applications, you should see a new folder called Docker. And if you expand this, you should be able to open the Quick Start Terminal. This will start off a process in your shell to start the Docker daemon. OK, and if you see the little Docker whale here, that means that you were successful. All right, the first thing I want to do now is flip back over to the LAMP stack that I had showed you earlier. And we actually want to run the commands in the getting started section of this web page. So the first thing we want to do is we actually want to pull down this image. So the command for that is docker pull janku forward slash Drupal LAMP. So I'm going to copy that and paste it over in this terminal here. You can see it starts running the downloading process. And it's downloading an image about one gigabyte here and it has to extract as well so at the end it'll be probably a little bit over two gigabytes of data so this may take a little time we, uh, we'll speed this up on our end but if it takes a little longer for you don't worry about it okay now that that's downloaded we can see the new image that we downloaded by typing docker images and you'll notice that we have the repository janku drupal lamp and it was created 22 minutes ago, and you can see the size of it here. So we'll flip back over to Docker Hub, and we'll copy this next command. So this run command is actually creating a container from this image. So I'm going to copy and paste that in there. And you'll notice that there's one place that you should probably change. So um, you can name the container. I'm going to remove your container name. And Stephanie, do you have a preference for what you rename this container? Drupal Sprint would be a good name. All right, Drupal Sprint. Drupal Sprint. And we'll just press Enter and start this container. OK, so if I type Docker PS now, it'll show me all my running containers. And I'm just going to expand this window a little bit to make this a little easier to read. So we'll notice we have a new container ID for this. You can see the image that this came from, uh, some port information and the name of the container there. So one thing that happens when you use the Docker toolbox is it gives you a default IP address. So you'll see at the top of your terminal here the IP address. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go to my browser. And I'm going to paste that in. So you're going to notice nothing is happening right now. And the reason that is is there's a couple processes on the container that need to be started manually. So there's a web server and there's a database. So the way we're going to start that is we're going to actually go into the container and execute commands inside of the container. So 
I'm going to run docker attach and the container name, which in this case is Drupal Sprint. You may have named this something else. So I can actually even copy that. Drupal Sprint and press enter. And what happens here for me in this container is it usually hangs. So I'm going to press enter one more time to actually get the command prompt inside of the t container. Um, so if you ever you know, try to run this command, it looks like nothing's happening, just press enter one more time and hopefully that resolves itself. And you can see that I'm in the container right now because I'm using a user of root and here is my container ID, which is the same as this container ID here. So I'm going to run service Apache 2 start. So this starts our web server, which is Apache 2. Then I'll press up to get my command back and I'll just edit this a little bit to run service MySQL start. And that said okay right here. And at this step of the process, if you run into any trouble, if it says fail or anything like that, just try it two or three times and usually it will start up. Um, many more than that, then maybe there might be another problem. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the web browser here and just refresh this page. Okay, we're getting the installation prompt here, that's great. Um, one other thing I wanna do is I'm just going to show you that HTTPS actually works for this website as well. Um, a lot of third-party services, if you're integrating with, say, Salesforce or something, um, require that you have HTTPS. So we created a self-signing certificate on the Docker container that allows you to use that protocol. Um, you'll notice that you may have to uh, accept a security exception in your browser. So you may get a prompt that says, hey, I don't recognize this website, and you have to create an exception in order to see it. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. You can just say accept. Okay, to run the installation process, we're going to say save and continue. We're going to install the standard profile. We're going to give um, ourselves a database name. You want to call this just Drupal Sprint? Does that work? Sure. Drupal Sprint. And the username and the password created on the Docker container is root root. So the username is root and the password is root. Something to note here is you should never do this for a production site because it's not very secure. Just since this is just for a local development, it's okay in this case. But um, if someone's setting up a server on something that's going to be live in the future, I would just say, don't ever do that. Okay, now that kicks off the installation process. This takes a little bit of time because we're using the standard profile, so it's downloading lots of modules and themes and things. Um, We'll probably speed it up on our end, but if it takes a little longer for you, don't worry about it. Okay, so everything installed, and you'll notice there's a security warning about changing some file permissions for the settings.php file. Um, we'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Stephanie, is there a particular name you want to use for your site name of uh, your Drupal installation? Let's go with the same names. Let's do Drupal Sprint. I like it. So for an email address, um, are you okay just using a fake one for now? Sure. So we'll use test, at example. And for username, I'm just going to put admin. For password, I'm just going to put admin. And I'm going to confirm that password. So never do that on a live site, because um, that's pretty easy for dictionary attacks and different things like that to break into your site. Um, for the country, we're going to specify that we are in the United States. And we're in Boston, so I believe the closest time zone we can pick here is actually um, America, New York. So we'll choose that. And we want to check for updates, but we don't really want to receive emails because we don't actually have access to this email. So we'll save and continue. OK, now we have our new Drupal site, and we're ready to go. You'll notice that it still is warning us about the settings.php file, so uh, we'll just go back here real quick. So we're still in our container, you notice here. We have our container ID as our server, and we're going to use a command called cd, which is change directories. It's to change the location of where we are on the computer. We're going to go into the folder var www and then 
Drupal. So this is where our actual website is listed. So if you do an LL command to list the files in this directory, you'll notice that it's a standard Drupal installation. Now, where settings.php lives is in sites default. And there's a file there called settings.php. So I'm going to, again, change directories into sites default. I'm going to list the files in here. And I'll make this a little bigger so people can see, hopefully. OK, so you notice there's a settings.php file. And if you look to the left of it, you'll see that there's rwx, rwx, rwx. And what that means is there's read, write, and execute permissions for um, the user, for the group, and oops, for the world there. So we don't want those permissions. We actually want permissions more similar to the permissions that are listed on the default.settings.php file, because that's actually where we copy this from. So we needed to temporary, temporarily change these permissions so we could install the site, but now we want to change them back to make them more secure. So the way we do that is we actually pass numbers. So each one of these groupings represents a number, and they represent a number that adds up to seven in total. So the reading accounts for four of the values, the writing accounts for two of the values, and the execution accounts for one of the values. So that allows you basically to have a memory um, uh, a memory efficient way of storing permissions. So for instance, if we have all three of these, this is seven, seven, and then the last one is seven, 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 seven. But if we were to look at this one, this is actually four plus two, so six, four, four. And that's just basically how you would specify these. So We'll run a command called chmod, and we'll set 644 so we can change this previously 777 to a 644 on the settings.php file. So I can run that, and if I list these files one more time, you'll notice that we've actually changed these settings here. And if we go back to our website and I do a control R, or command R in this case on a Mac, and reload the web page, we lose that error. And I think we're good to go here. OK, so I'm going to flip back to the terminal real quick. I just want to show a couple of quick tools that are on this to make your life a little easier, hopefully. So uh, the first one I want to show you is a tool called Tmux. So Tmux is a terminal multiplexer. And what that means is it gives you a way to have a bunch of different windows open on one terminal command prompt. So for instance, if you're running something like SAS and Compass, and SAS and Compass is a pre preprocessor for CSS, you need to run your compass, which actually looks for changes. And then in your other window, you need to run SAS so you can actually edit the uh, files and pre-compile CSS. So often that would have you like log into a server two different times in order to have two different windows. But with Tmux, you can actually just quickly open up two windows and run the process in different windows, which is really easy. So to get started, I'm going to run the command Tmux new, pass the S flag, and we can name this Steph, for instance. Is that okay? Sure, that's fine. Okay. So now we have, you'll see this green bar at the bottom here. And this is a window for us. So I'm actually going to do, uh, and I believe on a Mac, I'm, I'm more familiar with Linux, uh, Linux, but I think this is Command B. Command B. Oop, nope. Let's try Control B, comma. Okay. So what that does is it now allows us to name our window. So down here in the bottom, you see that this says bash. I'm going to change this. Um, to settings, because right now we are in the settings directory where our settings file is, right? I'm going to press enter, and then I'm going to do control B, and then press C afterwards, and that creates a new window. So now you'll notice that there's two of these windows down here. We have a settings and we have a bash. So in this window, I'm going to change directories back down um, to our Drupal root, and list the files. You can see we're in the main Drupal thing, and I'm going to name this um, for instance, base. So I'll do control B at the same time and then press comma and we'll call this, um, we'll call it doc root. How about, okay. So now if I want to switch between these two windows, I can easily press control B and then S. And now if I press the right arrow, it will expand these and I can switch between these two things here. So I want to go back to our settings file. And I'll run a command that says print working directory, PWD. 
It'll show you the path where we're at. So we're in var www Drupal sites default. And then I'll do control B S press the right arrow and I'll go back to uh, the doc route. I'll do a print working directory PWD and you'll see that we're just in var dub 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 Drupal. So Tmux is really useful. You can actually even do split screens. Um, so you can have like one window running one thing, one window running another that you can see at the same time. I'm not going to go into that much detail because it's not super important for this demo, but check out Tmux. There's a lot of cool things you can do with it. Oh, you have a question, Seth? So this was downloaded with the Docker image. This doesn't come with Drupal, I assume. Yeah, so this is a tool that we downloaded on the image. We have a lot of not Drupal specific tools on here to make your life a little easier while you're building things with Drupal. Uh, we do a lot of things through the command line. So having these tools right in the command prompt make things easier. That's great. Another tool that uh, I've found kind of useful is a new shell. So um, it's called fish. So you can run the fish command and basically you'll notice that my command prompt will change a little bit. So now, and this is a little, little wonky looking actually. So um, let's see if I can fix it, but I might have to actually get out of this and try it again. Yeah, so it's not adding up very good. Let's let's exit out of here. Let's try to run that one more time. Oh, there might be a problem with how I have Tmux running here and how we have fish going. So let's get out of this. I'm going to do a control B D to detach from Tmux. I'm gonna try to run fish out here first. Okay, so this prompt looks a little better now. If I clear this, you notice that um, it's giving some some uh, some guidance of where we are. So we're in a V for var. W for www, Drupal, uh, and then sites default folder here. Um, if I, again, I'm going to list my Tmux windows, Tmux LS. So I have Steph, so I can, um, let's see, Tmux attach to Steph. Oh, I spelled that incorrectly. It's Tmux, not Tmus. Okay, so we're back in the Steph window here. Um, if I go to the doc root, I'm gonna try to run fish again. Uh, I still got it kind of messed up here. But you also notice that it gives you a couple helpful commands here. Um, so this tells you which branch you're on because this is a Git project. This is actually has, um, sorry to keep jumping back and forth, but if you were to run um, take to see your, your Git history, you can see all the people who have committed to the Drupal project and you have all their history, all the things they, they did. So if we wanna see what Nathaniel did on January 17th, we can press enter here and it will show a little bit of uh, the changes that were made. So these lines were removed, the ones with the pluses were added, you can press Q to get out of that, Q to get out of it again. Um, but basically what's happening is if we change directory back down to um, our base directory here, you'll notice that it tells us what branch we're on over here in the right hand thing. So another way you could do that is you could run something like git branch v, and you can notice that we're on 8.2.x. So those are a couple of just quick commands. I think one last one I wanna show is vim. So vim is a text editor that you can use on the command line. Uh, so, for instance, I could vim, if we want to look at a module, maybe we want to look at, um, let's see, what do we have in here? We have modules, modules, I believe, whoops. Now, is this like the standard installation of vim, or is this like a configured one for Drupal, or? The vim, so vim we... In this case, we actually configured it to better handle Drupal. Um, it is not something that comes with Drupal itself. It's just a tool. You can use a bunch of different tools to edit the files. We're, we tend to use Vim because you can extend it and, and customize it in a lot of different ways. And just to kind of explain what I was doing here, I actually was looking in the modules folder. In Drupal 8, this is actually where you put contributive modules. So <clears throat> it doesn't ship with any contributed modules. So there's nothing in there. In Drupal 8, it's kind of nice. They actually put everything under core and then there is a modules folder within there. So we're gonna go into that, look around in here. Uh, maybe we wanna go into something like block, look at the files in here. Okay, let's edit the block.module file. So if we wanna edit that, we start with the command vim, say block.module. Okay, so now we're in the vim text editor and um, 
there's a couple cool things that are happening here. One thing that we have installed is a code sniffer to make sure you're conforming to Drupal's coding standards. And this is kind of interesting case. So like a lot of core things don't conform exactly to Drupal coding standards because core is pretty big. So I'm assuming, and I, I might be wrong, but once I save this file, we might see some flags about things that don't conform. It's possible we won't, but basically the way you save a file on Vim is you do a colon and then you press W and press enter. Okay, so on the left-hand side, you notice that it kind of popped over a little bit. So somewhere along the line here, something is probably flagged to the, okay, so here's the thing. So we see this little S on the, the left-hand side. If I scroll over that, you see that it says missing parameter type. So what that's really saying is when you use this comment here and say param, you should say if this, you know, if the theme list variable is an array or is it a string, like what is it? So it's basically saying it'd be nice if we were told what that is. And it technically is being said right here. Um, but I think what they want is something. So I'm going to edit this and actually to edit in Vim, you press I, uh, and then maybe you want to say something like array and then press escape to get out of insert mode, then do colon and a W and okay. So you notice that the, the, um, uh, the flag there actually went away. So that seemed to fix it, but we actually got a new flag miss down here. So hint type array, uh, hint hinting of array is missing. So you can do something called hinting here to kind of just say what this, um, argument is expecting. We're not going to go through and change all these things. Um, I assume that the people who wrote these, this block module probably know a lot more about Drupal coding standards than I do. So, uh, for now we're actually going to leave this and we don't really want to commit these changes. So I'm going to quit out of this editor. So you can do colon and a Q to get out of the editor. And you'll notice now though, um, if I were to do a get status, since we had saved, um, the file, you'll notice that uh, we have uh, modified this file here. So we could actually revert these changes so we don't commit them. You'll also notice there's some changes here. So when we, before this video, uh, when we we're creating the container, we actually created a vendor folder by running composer install to get all the software we need to run this uh, website. We also created a settings file, uh, file for our database con connection configuration. And we created a files directory, which is where we would upload files and, you know, images and PDFs and things like that. We probably don't want to revert these changes. So what we could do is we could add them to a git ignore file, or we could use a git command called update index and pass a flag that says assumed unchanged and then the file name. That's all we're going to do in this demo for now. In the future, we'd like to do another video that gets into more details about debugging using Vim and some other tools on the Docker container. Uh, thank you guys for watching and thank you, Stephanie, for letting us hijack your computer for the day.